really pleased to, to welcome uh, a free author here today. Uh, I've shared the stage with her so on several occasions. I'm always very happy if I don't have to follow her directly because she <laughs> always gives such a fantastic, energetic, uh, uh, you know, information-filled talk that it's, it's a hard, hard act to follow. So I'm really glad to have, have her here. She's originally from Southeast Michigan where she studied uh, landscape design at Purdue University. Um, she's been in the business for quite a while now. She's done estate gardening uh, at Montrose. She's done uh, nursery production with Plant Delights and Camellia Forest. Um, you know, really hitting all the highlights here in you know, this horticultural mecca. Um, but where she really shines, well, I should say one place, as a propagator, she's phenomenal, but, but as a, a garden um, communicator. Uh, she is really committed to getting the message out that, that all things horticultural is way in the future. Um, and really is good at inspiring people with, with the message. Uh, she speaks internationally on a variety of horticulture topics. As a correspondent on the PBS television show, Growing the Greener World, she shares practical advice from her one-acre suburban foodscape, encouraging everyone to embrace the hobby and lifestyle of home gardening. 2016 brings many new ventures, including, very exciting, her new book, Mm -hmm. The Foodscape Revolution by St. Lynn's Press. Mm -hmm. A lot going on with, with uh, Bree. We're happy we could have her here because she's always off somewhere else giving us off. So please join me in welcoming Bree. Mm -hmm. I'll be up there in a moment. Okay. <laughs> I'm really loud. I probably don't actually need this. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. All right. So I might actually ditch it because otherwise I might be too loud for you with the microphone on. Um, oh, and I didn't get the clicker. I am working on that over here. <laughs> and we're having our own technical. I don't want to get the microphone or your clicker. We're having our own technical difficulties over here. Uh, 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 oh. Oh gosh, are you going to make me? Yeah. Oh gosh, y'all, oh, I'm so loud. Is it better? Oh, no. Turn it down, yeah. I'm going to have to whisper the talk. I'm not good at that. Not good. Well, you know, I was thinking um, on my drive up here from Pukeway, not a very long drive, but a treacherous one with the traffic we all have now. How, how honored I am to get to be at the Ralston Arboretums. This is our hub. You know, here in Raleigh, we are so fortunate to have this community of people that are devoted to horticulture and gardening. And as I've traveled around the country, I've realized that not every place is like this. And we owe so much of this spirit of community to the people that work at this facility. So. I just want everybody to give a round of applause to the people who make this possible. <laughs> every day, every, every time they organize something, encourage everyone that you know to attend because it's a privilege to get to be in a place that continues education in such a meaningful way. And it's an absolute treat for me to get to be here. So thank you for inviting me. So as, as they mentioned, my name is Bree, and um, I'm really a plant nerd. Not well adjusted at all. <laughs> I like plants and I like cats. <laughs> and I don't deny it, ever. <laughs> and my degree is in design, and, um, but I've never really formally worked as a designer. I think that sometimes when you have that sensibility, it just never leaves you. Uh, oh, it got dark, yeah. <laughs> And for most of my career, I was a propagator. And that's, for me, the thing that's intuitive about growing plants. I like putting roots on things. I like getting seeds to germinate. And it's a privilege, and I'm grateful to be able to be devoting my time as a communicator. But I always dream long term of being back in the back of a propagation house, sticking cuttings for weird plants so that people in this room can be satisfied with having interesting options that typical garden centers don't carry. So I want to ask you all, how would you finish the sentence? Growing food is fun, frustrating, <laughs> it can be, especially when we're dry. Anybody else have a, a thought that comes to your mind? Essential, practical. 
critical. That's right. All of those things. I call it the ace of horticulture. You know, like the ace hardware. It's awesome. It's creative, and it's empowering. And I really think that all of these things are really meaningful as we try to engage more broad demographics. I don't just mean young people. I mean people of all ages that have never really encountered horticulture in a meaningful way. And I'm not going to live a happy life until I've convinced every person that I that will listen to me that gardening is awesome and creative and empowering. <laughs> and I hope that they will devote some of their disposable income to what we all work so hard to be able to create for this society. Um, some things that I think are particularly awesome I've recently become obsessed with live wall. Has, it, it, how many of you are friends with me on social media? <laughs> Have you been following the caterpillars? Oh my gosh, it's the coolest thing ever. I cannot wait for the garden tour to come on Tuesday because honestly, you're going to freak out. This wall was shipped to me from Michigan, pre-planted. I didn't have to do anything. Literally all we've done is hooked it up to a hose. It has a sprinkler or a, a nozzle thing that it, it automatically waters. It's literally the easiest thing I have ever done in a garden. And one whole side is all different food crops. And it's now host to probably 150 swallowtail caterpillars that are <laughs> actively turning into chrysalis and I'm videotaping them with my iPhone. It's absolutely extraordinary. Uh, but you know, I think there are creative ways to engage people and something like a live wall may be the thing because not everybody has the, the opportunity to grow on a one acre plot of land like I have in Pukwe. And so most of my talk is really about growing food in the ground, but I don't want to ever discourage people that live in apartments or condos to not try growing something and in a really creative way. And along those lines, I really think that the tower garden is super awesome. Um, I got into growing things out of the ground, hydroponics, aquaponics, aeroponics, because I live in a former tobacco field, and I have root knot nematodes that should be in textbooks. Mm -hmm. They are crazy, and they get into everything. Don't ever let somebody tell you, oh, nematodes don't get into that, because it's a bunch of hogwash. Mm -hmm. They will devour roots of everything, magnolia and a skinny minute. I determined that I am not going to let nematodes make it so that I can't throw my annual tomato tasting party, which thank you to those who came and melted with us in the extreme <laughs> August heat. Uh, but the tower garden for me has been a super solution because it's compact. Again, it's only taking up three square feet. It's on automated timer and it's extremely water uh, efficient. So again, you know, growing food in a way that's creative, this can be wheeled inside. You can actually grow things year round and not even have to have a greenhouse. Uh, you know, it actually extends the season quite a bit. I was growing lettuce well into the summer because the water is cool as it goes through the root zone. But I want to see if anybody recognizes some of my favorite vegetables or edibles that nobody seems to really grow in their garden. So does anybody recognize this? Shout it out. Be proud, Preston. Peanut. Peanut. That's right. It's a peanut. How many of you have grown peanuts? I mean, here we are in North Carolina. They're in the fields all over the place. People don't recognize what they look like. But it's one of the most beautiful edibles that you can grow. It's very low maintenance. It's very drought tolerant. It's got these nice yellow flowers all summer. It's a beautiful little mound. It doesn't really have any insect problems. And you want to get the guys in your life excited, have them yank the plants out of the ground at the end of the season. <laughs> they will have never experienced that before. My husband tolerates a lot of horticulture. I'll tell you, his life changed last year when his task for the day was to deal with the peanuts. <laughs> um, you know, they, every root nodule will have a nut, you yank them out. I highly recommend planning to harvest around <coughs> the weather report. Do y'all remember last fall? When it rained every day for like 25 days straight, we thought Noah's Ark was going to come. Yeah, I harvested my peanuts in the middle of that. That was not the right plan. Uh, I had to, you know, put fans on them and storm in sheds. And so don't do that. Do, learn often from me of what not to do. A wonderful example of taking the hard road and then teaching people otherwise. All right, so does anybody recognize this? You're not allowed to answer, Tim. <laughs> balsam. What? Balsam or platinum? I haven't heard it yet. 
Who said it? Backer. Sesame. That's right. Sesame. You know, this edible that nobody really appreciates, but we all enjoy and baked goods, especially breads. I originally got this from Monticello, which is where I'm going tomorrow. And um, it's an absolutely gorgeous plant. I don't understand why this isn't in cell packs at garden centers in the spring. It's super easy to grow from seed. It looks just like a foxglove. I mean, look at, look at how pretty. It's going to ultimately grow about five foot tall, set enough seed per plant for half of Wake County. If you're ever in need of sesame seeds, just call me up. I have plenty. It's actually a really great plant, though, to be able to make oil. High, high culinary use for sesame oil. And I happen to have a press because I also grow sorghum. And it turns out the sorghum press works really well to press sesame seeds. So the main point of the foodscape revolution is to really start a conversation. I admittedly give 90% of my presentations to people in the green industry. And we can be a little bit short-sighted. You know, people that are into trees are only into trees. People that are into herbaceous perennials, that's all they focus on. We don't often look at the big picture and understand how our end consumer wants a little bit of all of it. And there's a real need to have merchandising that reflects this and then knowledge within the industry to be able to really get this information out to the people that need it the most. You know, what we eat matters. I think we're living in an era now where people all pretty well recognize that. But we're not often enough having discussion about how our food was raised and where it was raised. So is anybody familiar with the term food miles? Yeah, I mean, it's a big deal. And it's a big deal that our society is kind of shielded from because we don't really have to take responsibility for understanding the process in which we access food. But if you think of the statistic, every single item in the grocery store has traveled an average of 1,500 miles, and you count 20 things in your grocery cart every week, really start thinking about the carbon footprint that that's leaving, and the legacy that that's going to leave, and the burden that that's created for feeding a growing population that's going to be almost twice as large in, in less than 50 years. So grocery store chains are really concerned about it, and of all the chains to be, the lead, the lead on this, it's Walmart that's suggesting that hyper-localized food systems are actually the way of feeding the population of 2050. That's really not that long from now. And that's a big change in the way food is distributed currently. So, you know, the dirty dozen, everybody should be aware of this and then you're going to start becoming phobic of things at the grocery store like I am. <laughs> so the green checks are the things that I grow. Well, I, I don't grow all of my own apples, uh, but everything else, I'm not sure why apples got a check. I was up late last night, y'all. <laughs> this book is killing me. My hat's off the people who write. Oh my gosh, it's so hard. <laughs> but you know, these are things that I grow. I try to grow about 100% of what we consume. Like I said, we're in a, an acre lot in Fuquay. We're technically gardening on the square footage of a quarter acre. And it's really not the space that matters, but the efficiency in which you use that land. So one of my main goals as a horticulture professional that isn't in the behind the scenes of the <coughs> propagation house now is to connect the value of horticulture to health and wellness. And this is unfortunately something that the ornamental industry completely disregards. You know, we talk about how you need to have beauty in this world, and we do, but it's difficult to quantify beauty. It's not difficult to quantify that you are healthier because you are actively gardening, or that you are healthier because you are consuming better food. This is the future of horticulture. The fact that we get to be included in the umbrella of food production is such a privilege. And I hope that this will continue, especially with younger generations, and with programs like the children's gardening program here, so that children are aware that plants impact their, their lives in so many different facets. And it's not just for pretty along the highway. It's that it touches your life every single time you eat. 
I do this with a lot of elementary schools, and I'm super excited that I got to visit a school in North Carolina today. It almost never happens. I spend like half my year in New Jersey now because <laughs> the Garden State has really picked up on the importance of having horticulture in elementary school education. And uh, today I, I was actually in Apex, at an elementary school, and I think they're wanting to go this route. And it, it's a very exciting time because if we aren't impacting the eight-year-olds, when they grow up to be 28 and 38, they might not ever pick horticulture up because they were never introduced to it. They, know, they don't have the confidence to think that they can keep a plant alive. You know, that's the biggest thing I hear now. People my age and a little bit younger, I have a black thumb. Well, first of all, if you have a black thumb, that means you're doing it right because that means you're putting your fingers in the earth, right? <laughs> I, green side up, y'all. <laughs> But we were introduced to horticulture. So we don't have that moment to reflect on that, hey, I was good at this when I was a kid, and I think I've gotten smarter, so I must be able to do this now. And not only is that an issue with regard to horticulture, but you know, it's a problem with cooking, and it's why we all have a responsibility to teach anybody that we can touch practical skills that the schools aren't able to actually instill. Whoops. And of course, I think that all food should be nutritious, and I think that more food needs to be local. And for me, the foodscaping movement really is about harnessing the power of the 190 million suburban acres of the United States. Now, 190 million acres is all of our parks put together. It's twice the space that's devoted to commercial agriculture is an enormous opportunity to make land that's being cultivated for not much into something that has so much more purpose. So I want to tell you about the potato story because I think this is a great example and something that as home gardeners you can possibly influence for me my neighbor's kids who have really become extremely talented horticulturalists. Aiden here is going to make a landscaper very, very happy when he is a working teenager. <laughs> Actually, he knows too much, so he might frustrate them. <laughs> and so I asked him what his favorite thing to eat was, and what do you think he said? French fries. French fries, of course, you know. And so I said, well, we're all going to grow French fries in a way. I, I don't have a fry daddy, so we're not going to totally take it to that level. So we, I did just trenches with a mattock. You can see my favorite tool of all time is a, is a mattock. A mattock of any size, it doesn't matter. It's the only thing you need. And I'll get soon pruners. Um, but I dig trenches along all of my edges. Edges are such a powerful space in the landscape. Typically, they're not really used. You know, it's that battle line between your grass and your mulch bed. What do you do with it? You spray it. That sucks, you know. Why not use it for something useful? You know, onions, potatoes, garlic. Let me get, I'll tell you all about garlic in a little bit. But I like to do potato edges. And we plant these usually in March. And, um, you know, not very deep. I know there's a lot of trendy ways you can grow potatoes, but they're awfully easy in the ground in our climate. So I'm not sure why you do it any other way. These are just sliced off pieces that started growing on my counter. <laughs> and then on the hottest day of June, and trust me, it always works this way, I was settling in for an afternoon coma of Netflixing. <laughs> and Aiden came to the door and he said, but Miss Bree, the potato foliage is senescing. <laughs> I was like, oh God, he's learning my language. <laughs> This was shortly after his teacher sent home a note saying she thought he was inventing words. <laughs> and he was actually talking botanical Latin. So there you have it. He does force feed botanical Latin on every eight-year-old you have access to. <laughs> so we went out and we harvested 80 pounds of potatoes. You know, and he was pretty doggone excited because he had planted these potatoes. But the real thing here was that for our Fourth of July party, he got to cook potatoes for the first time ever. Now that's okay, he's eight, right? He shouldn't really be cooking too much. But do you know who else's first time it was cooking potatoes? His mom. 
36. How can you live 36 years and never boil a potato? I Googled it. It turns out she's actually not in the minority. It freaks me out. I start to have these, like, how can I be a part of this generation? Oh my gosh, what's happened? She couldn't believe how easy it was. <laughs> Score one, you know? <laughs> so we ended up making possibly some of the ugliest potatoes you'll ever see, but they were delicious. And you see, I added a peacock to that because he should have had a peacock tail as he was serving these potatoes to the neighbors, explaining that on a cool Saturday morning in March, he planted <coughs> them. And on a hot Saturday afternoon in, in June, he, he dug them up. And he got to see the whole cycle through. Now he comes over once a week and he takes a bag of potatoes. He's done demonstrations at school. He kind of owns potatoes now. <laughs> you know, that's good, right? That's, that's, that's what we need. And that's the point. Food is a catalyst to something more. But food is so essential. It's the one thing that every human being on this earth shares. That and fresh water, clean air. It's one of the most critical things we can't live without. The great thing is, you hang out with eight-year-olds and you start to realize that, God, you can learn a lot from them. And so I want to tell you the story behind this slide, and I'm glad it's dark because I always get a little teary-eyed. I think these two need to be our president and vice president. <laughs> they came running up. We were doing the SEED initiative, and this is in uh, Glassboro, New Jersey. It's a Schedule One school. 95% of the kids are on state and federal assistance. And this garden has made a significant impact in this community. It's actually incredible. It started with an elementary school. The whole school district has picked it up, and now the entire municipality has done it. And that's why I go to New Jersey all the time. I'll be there in like two weeks. Uh, but they're growing food in these common everyday landscapes because they see the value that it's helping create a more nutritious Glassboro community. These kids came running up to me, and I did not let them have pruners. Because, <laughs> you know, I can be absent-minded. So I thought, oh my gosh, how could they be bleeding? You know, they looked like they were in distress. And you know what they said? Oh my god, we're finally the same color. <laughs> Holy crap, everybody in this world needs to hear that, right? Everybody needs to stick their hands in the earth and realize we're all the same. We all need the same things. We're all equal in this world as human beings. And so every time I go, I'm always shocked the insights that these little people provide and how somehow it gets lost as we grow up and become cynical and start eating poorly. <laughs> Maybe that's what it is. It's in our food supply. So a little history about why I started doing this. Actually, it wasn't just to be idealistic. It was because I was super poor, and I couldn't afford the produce I wanted to eat. You know, I'm from that generation that invested in houses before the market crashed. <laughs> yeah, some prime generation. And it made a big impact in my ability to have a disposable income at all. And when people complain that millennials aren't investing, I say, hey, do what you feel comfortable with because you don't need to make economic decisions based off of the luxuries that generations of the past had that don't exist now. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, that we all have to face in this world that, you know, it's expensive to live, period. Mm -hmm. And maybe buying a house isn't the solution. And we all have to figure out ways to still get non-house buyers to invest in horticulture. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, my mom is a retired social worker. She just retired in January, 20 years in South Detroit. And she's always been very supportive of my passion in horticulture. But there was always that moment of like, gosh, but your whole industry is only here for people with disposable income. And it's true. We're a luxury market. Whether we want to acknowledge it as such, that is what horticulture is providing. You know, you don't hire a landscaper when you're not making your mortgage payment. And that's a shame because you're not hiring a landscaper to help you grow food that would then give you a disposable income in a different way. And so I was living in this Pulte subdivision in Fuquay because it was the place that I could afford to buy a house. And I, Tim can attest to this and Preston and Aaron, I turned this 
crazy quarter acre lot into something that looked very odd from a Google map. <laughs> I mean, it was from satellites, you could see a lunatic lived in this place. <laughs> but that was what was so neat. You know, it was this plastic, everyday subdivision that's covering this world with a lot of resources. You know, there's soil, there's sun, there's irrigation, there's an HOA, there's professional landscape maintenance. What are we getting out of those services? Nothing, nothing really at all. Nothing, nothing that made my life feel better. So I came up with this idea, <laughs> and I'll tell you again to so learn from my mistakes. Google, Google a slogan in advance, okay? Uh. Seriously, <laughs> extremely important. <laughs> so, you know, I was so excited. I, I got picked up. Carol Stein did this nice article about what I was doing in this very wholesome process of growing food to supply the neighbors that surrounded me and I was able to produce 50% of what they were eating for the year, produce-wise. And that's actually pretty significant from a quarter acre lot. That made it so that my neighbor across the street could send her son to soccer camp because she had more money in her budget because she wasn't spending it all on groceries at Harris Teeter. And that made me start thinking about, wow, well, what if every fourth house in my neighborhood did that? How would that change the economics of the people living around me? How could this really positively impact community while getting people to eat fresh produce because it's so doggone convenient they can't deny it, you know? Well, it turns out Eat My Yard was used, and I'll let your imaginations <laughs> take you to where it was on a cease and desist letter. <laughs> I stopped using that tagline. Shortly after the house flooded, I moved away and I started the garden I'm in now. But I'm left with the idea that this space has so much more potential than what it's currently being utilized for. Frankly, most of the people living in these houses resent every bit of green space they have. Preston has made this point so many times. People buy houses that are too big, but they're also dealing with property sizes that are maybe too big for their level of interest or expertise in managing it. And so perhaps there needs to be a whole new identification of what the American dream is. And maybe it isn't a McMansion with two acres of turf that needs to be mown every 10 days. I sure hope that's the direction we're going. But so a foodscape is simple. This is not a new concept. This is actually an old school concept that unfortunately somehow got lost as ornamental horticulture grew and developed and kind of kicked the vegetables to the back corner of the backyard simply the integration of edibles in a traditional landscape. You know, I'm sick of this. <laughs> I'm ashamed of this, right? This sucks. Somebody paid for this? Oh my God, they should be fined. The landscape company that installed this should be paying the municipality for their lack of capacity to do their job. This is terrible. This is a standard that should not be tolerated. You know, I give knockout roses a hard time for a good reason. They are not the solution. We do not need to be replacing crappy monocultures with new crappy monocultures. <laughs> this is taken in the Harris Teeter parking lot in Cary, off of Kildare. Okay, there are 72 infected knockout roses in this parking lot. They've been there for three years. They have not been removed. They are never going to not be sick. This is where the bar needs to be raised. I can't believe that a professional company is managing this space and they're actually getting a check every month. Mm -hmm. This is unacceptable. And until everybody says so, they're going to keep doing this. We've got to collectively raise the landscape bar. This is crazy. This is not why I joined our culture. Medicare. <laughs> I said this once in front of Star Roses and it was not great. <laughs> My reception was chilling. You know, I think this sucks. Does anybody feel inspiration from this? I know this is not a local picture. My friend Jared took this. And um, he said, oh, the homeowners were so proud that they took out all their turf. And the thing is, you know, turf actually holds water. And so you see all the crazy edging they had to put in because of this amazing amount of mulch. I was like, did the mulch at least come from a tree that fell on site? No. No, it, it traveled like 500 miles to land here. 
Now, Chris, I think this is Roundup's dream come true because I don't know what you're going to do in this garden other than spray Roundup, but if you have open space and sunlight, you're going to get something to grow there. That is the <laughs> essence of nature, right? So I'm saying open mulch space is a huge opportunity. And as I drive through suburbia, I see a heck of a lot of open mulch space. Why not let your open mulch space grow something different? Why not let some pretty zinnias seed around so that you can feed 10,000 swallowtail butterflies? Trust me, when y'all come next week, you're gonna go into a butterfly coma. <laughs> and you're all gonna look like your Pokemon. I think my neighbors are, uh, really think I'm a Pokemon person, but I'm really out there taking butterfly pictures. <laughs> you know, what's wrong with including beauty and ecology and nutrition all in the same space? Why do these ever have to be separated from one another? Why has that ever been an acceptable thing? that somehow a beautiful landscape can't also provide nutrition and be managed in a way that supports a local ecology. Why are landscapes barren of insects? It's like the opposite of living in a well-rounded world. Of course, it all starts with good soil. And you know, we have a lot of good soil in North Carolina. But I have to say I'm completely smitten with this program <laughs> that Super Sod has done. And if you were at the tomato tasting, we had one of these that went in the auction and they got a super deal on it. <laughs> Just really jealous that it left my property. But you know, this is a great thing. I, I will say in the past, you know, I've made the decision of having 20 yards of soil delivered and then I hated my life because every minute that soil pile got larger. I know Helen has done this. <laughs> and it's a horrible thing to face. And then your husband's like, I can't park. Oh, why did you do this, right? And then they have more pressure and you start to resent the process. So that's not the right solution. Get a bag, it's waterproof. Have your neighbor's kids distribute it for you. It's even better. <laughs> I guarantee there are children in every neighborhood that if cultivated could be the best helpers that you have ever experienced. And a tiny feet, they'll step on anything and do much damage. They're very trainable at this age. Of course, you know, it's also really important that we get away from salt-based fertilizers, especially in the ground. You know, I come from traditional horticulture. I understand how nurseries work. I understand that fertility and, and you know, unnatural medias or non-soil, soilless medias, you know, filtrates in a different way. But if you want to have healthy, happy plants, you need to have healthy, heavy soil that's full of microbes. Mm -hmm. And if you keep putting the blue stuff down, you're going to kill all your microbes. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to have disease problems. And then those disease problems are gonna trigger the insects. And then all of a sudden you have a space that's not in balance, right? Think about your tummy. Why do you need to eat yogurt? Because you need to have microbial activity, getting in there and make everything digest. It's the same thing with soil, so stop calling the orkin man. Please. All right, as a designer, especially a designer in Cary, <laughs> whew, people in Cary, you have it hard. <laughs> Not in Fuquay, but like the Wild West, you know? <laughs> oh, Homer boards, Homer associations. You know, I have to say, I think they have a lot of good purposes but they also have a lot of problems. And part of it is that they're generally made up of people that are often bored and have no actual education in horticulture. And they make these insane rules. And then you have to apply it because that is what they said. And as a designer, I have to say, well, okay, look at it this way. Let's not ban all vegetables in the front yard. Let's identify why you're offended by vegetables and work around that. I don't ever want a horticulture to be the cause of your neighbors hating you. I can say that horticulture makes my garden look better than anybody else in my neighborhood. People who have been in my neighborhood can probably attest to this. Um, and there's no reason that an HOA board should target people that garden and that garden well and that garden within the legal restrictions of the agreement they signed accidentally when they bought that house. <laughs> let's face it, that's not what you're looking at. You're looking at faucets and, you know, light fixtures. 
So the main reason HOAs say that you can't grow food is because of this. Now, do you know why this is an illustration? It doesn't exist. That's right. <laughs> ha -ha, nobody's box bed ever looks this pretty ever. <laughs> Period. Start judging. I give you permission to go around and judge people's box beds. Even if their produce looks good, they probably haven't steamed the lumber. You know, or just kept it tidy. Just keep an edge around it. You know, I often will say, Will, will and Preston can giggle this. The difference between permaculture and foodscaping is an edge. I like an edge. I live in the suburbs, you know. Come on, give me a little type A opportunity here. So, box beds, number one reason. People want to tear out all their grass and pretend they're a farmer for a season, and then they realize how hard it is, and they're like, ooh, I'm done. And then their yard is a real mess, and then their HOA has to get after them, and then they go to court, and all kinds of craziness ensues. So I want to show you an example. Now, I'm not particularly turned on by these beds to begin with. In this school garden that I was at today, I kept telling them, let's not waste money on lumber. Let's invest more in plants. I think that, that uh, you can grow plants mounted on soil that's straight on the ground without being encased in, in two by fours. But this is what happens when you go on vacation, right? <laughs> Hello. It's ugly. It's not productive. You can't even mow it. I mean, my God, this is a nightmare. This is a horrible, horrible decision. And I don't know where in the last 30 years people lost their minds that this is the only way they can grow food, but it's not. First of all, these beds are too small. That's like one zucchini plant. Are you really going to make an event in this world growing one zucchini plant? No. Okay. So, I did some math, and these are averages of North Carolina, especially Wake County Foundation landscapes. If you look at just the open mulch space, meaning the space that's left between trees and shrubs, this is mostly for new developments where people haven't invested in cool plants to fill in these gaps. The equivalent of 45 raised beds is already in cultivation, in existence, without you having to tear out sod, or, well, do anything. These beds are already there. Now, likely your soil isn't prepped quite properly, but nevertheless, 45 raised beds is a lunatic's like, nightmare. That's like running a CSA. No one in their right mind should cultivate 1,450 square feet of seasonal vegetables. You'll never be able to leave your house. <laughs> nevertheless, the opportunity is there. So think if you just take the sunny side, say the south and west sides of your foundation. Well, that's half of that. That's a pretty significant amount of square footage. So that's exactly the point. You're just using these open spaces. You know, there's a compacta holly hedge. Here's a, a Japanese maple and limelight hydrangeas and several taxes. All the normal things that you find in a foundation landscape just happens that there's a lot of open space that's surrounding those traditional shrubs that I can use for both flowers and bounty. So my next point really does go to long. And I will admit, I started as a turf grass major. I love lawn. I love mowing it. I love straight lines. I don't like uh, using synthetic chemistries. I think you can grow a beautiful green space and it not be exclusively fescue. I, of course, have uh, centipede turf, which I feel very blessed to have down in the sandy soil of Fuquay. But for me, it's definitely not about ripping out all of your turf, because turf is really the one plant that almost universally everybody gets. You know, they understand that it's green, and they mow it, and then it goes dormant, and they leave it alone. That's not always the case. You would believe that people kind of mess around with other plants even when they're dormant. You know, they think, I killed my oak, it lost its leaves. <laughs> and how to make it this long, you know? But I think that turf is an extremely important element. Now, I think that our turf to bed ratios, especially in the suburbs, could be changed. We're actually at an 80% turf, 20% shrub base right now. And I think that that could certainly be altered to allow beds to be a little larger. But, you know, the ultimate thing is turf is permeable and turf slows water. And we live in an area that gets an influx of rain often all at once. And if we don't have grass, you're going to have a mess. This spring, we were all at that conference. I can't remember who it was for, the sustainable, well, I don't know. 
Anyhow, it was a, a, in town, an urban farm, and they had done raised beds, and they'd torn out all their grass, and then they were talking about having major erosion issues, and it was like, well, if you'd just left the grass in between the beds, you probably wouldn't have any trouble at all, because grass does its job. It absorbs that excess water. This is at Moore Farms. This is also at Moore Farms. I'm completely smitten with this place. If you ever get a chance, go to Moore Farms. It's a life-changing botanical garden. Uh, Preston's been telling me this for years. I finally got there in July. It was 108. Maybe don't go in July. Uh, but this is the coolest thing. It's a turf-on-turf -turf installation. And when you go way up onto the fire tower, it's in the shape of a tobacco leaf because Moore Farm was an old tobacco growing facility and probably still is. They have a lot of land still in agronomic cultivation. But this while I was there, it got me really jazzed up, you know, because it's like very type A. And it got me thinking about my obsession with grains, turf on grains, right? <laughs> yeah, I try not to overdo grains in this talk, but it's very difficult for me. It's been completely, completely, like my mind has gone to a different planet. Carbohydrates are super important. I don't care if you're paleo. You're eating carbs somehow because the animals you eat are also eating carbohydrates. So nobody in this room is getting away from carbohydrates. Nobody is talking about carbohydrates in the local food movement. And that is a huge, huge problem because we consume more carbs than tomatoes. Tomatoes do not make the base of our diet. So it's awesome that we have local seasonal produce, but what we really need to have access to are the staples. And wheat happens to be one of those staples that I would like to see more commonly used in general, agronomically and in the landscape, because I think that it has an incredible amount of beauty. Um, Preston, you're going to get a giggle out of this. Erin, too. It's her band cover. <laughs> if you want to follow the ventures, just Google the hashtag Crazy Grain Lady, and you can see it from the very beginning. It's uh, going into its third season now. Is there anything more beautiful than that? I think not. I say put this up against any penicetum, and at least you can eat this, you know? Uh, Miss Campus, Miss Who, why would you grow that? Come on, you have grains, they can feed you, or nothing. Nevertheless, you'll have a new appreciation for how cheap a bag of flour is. Because trust me, it's extremely labor intensive, Helen experienced it. So you hand harvest it, and then you hand thresh it, like back in the olden days, you beat it. And then you hand grind it, and then you earned that quesadilla. Because <laughs> you expended a lot more energy than you're going to be consuming. I'm not suggesting that we're all going to grow wheat for consumption, or to raise awareness and get more local agriculture involved in our, in our carbohydrates to make them more sustainable. Of course, I think oats are another absolutely gorgeous plant. has a wider leaf. It's taller. It's very upright. Um, I had some trouble with wheat this year. The ancient varieties, which I'm keen to grow, don't have a lot of structural integrity. They lodged when we had a lot of spring rain. The oats were really sturdy. They also have roots that go like 12 feet deep. So if you have erosion problems, stick oats in. Uh, this year, I'm doing something different. In years past, I, I grew all these grains direct in the ground like a farmer would. This year, I'm either digging a hole and planting a clump like of seeds, or I'm growing them out in communal trays and then transplanting them. But I want to see what their aesthetic can be when they're grown in a slightly more traditional ornamental grass form rather than looking like a farmer's field. I think it's going to be successful. I mean, I just can't get enough of this. I think it's beautiful. That's a limelight hydrangea behind it. That's a golden rider lay one. Oh. So rice to me is the ultimate solution. This has been the plant that has had the best legs as far as the food skating movement goes. Because it looks, well, especially in, if you look uh, when the lights come back on, they put some purple leaf rice in that arrangement. It's a great substitution for the purple fountain grass. And one of the main differences is purple fountain grass collapses when we get rain as, you know, as the season progresses into fall. And then it's just like a big wet mess. Well, rice does not do that. It has great structural integrity. And all of the upland varieties grow perfectly fine and normally, um, I don't want to say irrigated, but 
landscapes that you might be adding some supplemental water to when we're in extreme dry. Um, you know, we don't have an irrigation system at my house, but by no means do we let our plants get thirsty. We like to pay Harnett County a lot of water, a lot of money through our water bill. <laughs> <laughs> it brings us pleasure. <laughs> But of course, I grow this out. I got it into about 150 commercial landscapes this year. Grew them in, in these communal trays, and then the landscapers just plucked out clumps. And it was really cool to see them planted in these like high-end containers on golf courses, which is so insane to me. Uh, they have no idea that they're actually growing something edible. Actually, they do now because I made them learn it, but <laughs> they didn't at the time. <laughs> So, you know, the point of growing food is that you grow what you love. Don't grow food you don't like. If you don't like tomatoes, don't waste time and energy. Um, I love everything that's a problem, so I have to grow everything all together. Um, but my main thing that I love is cream sausage tomatoes. And if you haven't grown this yet, get with it. Just go ahead and get with it. Uh, if you haven't lived a happy life until you've at least tried it, and then I promise you'll be converted. There's no such thing as low acid tomatoes. I go on tomato rants a lot. There are these yellow and white and orange varieties do have a higher sugar content, and that's what gives you that extra sweetness instead of the sharpness that you get from the bright red traditional tomatoes. And um, this is a plant, you see, one of the reasons that I love it, it's not because she's gonna win Miss North Carolina, <laughs> it's because she's gonna win Miss Congeniality. You know, look at how many fruits are on that plant at one time. That's insane. This is one of the grafted cream sausage that were sold here during Ralston Blooms. And Arlene and I talked about it tonight, and I think we will have that arrangement again. So next spring, get with it and buy your heirloom tomatoes grafted here at the event on April 1st. So the plant palette for foodscaping is really what excites me the most because I'm a plant nerd. And I, for one, am sick of these distinctions in plants. I'm sick of going into a garden center, seeing the vegetables segregated and the perennials alphabetical here, and the herbaceous annuals on another side, and then the trees and shrubs lined up, as if the consumer is supposed to understand what the botanical Latin means. Because, I mean, let's face it, that's for us, not <laughs> for everyone else. That's OK. So I believe that all plants matter. I think that you have to choose plants based off of what you want from them and the conditions that you have. And you don't have to worry exclusively if it is only from Wake County. Because there are a heck of a lot of plants that do extraordinarily well here that come from China and Japan. Just go to Asian Valley. Of course, I did spend quite a lot of my time producing non-native perennials and trees and shrubs, so of course I'm of that camp. But I think that there are great plants in each one of these categories and we need to stop identifying <coughs> plants just by these attributes, because every plant does provide a purpose somewhere on this planet. When I say all plants matter, I really do mean it. Hydrangea paniculata is my all-time favorite living steak. You know, you grow, does anybody grow heirloom tomatoes? They're big and ugly, right? There's not, they're not pretty. You don't want those to be in your foundation landscape as a standalone. But you can plant them. This is sweet summer. It blooms about four weeks before limelight. It's a little bit smaller in stature. It's an absolutely fantastic living steak for a big, fat, ugly black crim. Mm -hmm. I get a heck of a lot of fruit off of it because both need exactly the same cultural conditions. Full sun, evenly, evenly watered, spring fertility. Add some calcium for tomatoes. Fundamentally, the thing is, Food crops aren't biodiverse. You know, on average, we're actually only pulling from four families when Americans are growing vegetables. Uh, number one, Solanaceae, of course, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, potatoes, Brassicaceae, what we're all planting right now and then fighting with cabbage worms over. <laughs> I have ground zero at my house, <laughs> let you know. Uh, Fabaceae, you know, some of the different beans and peas, and Amaranthaceae, which is Probably not what you expect, but that's what Swiss chard and spinach are also a part of the beets. Uh, but really, you put those together and you're not getting to biodiversity. But what we have in our ornamental landscapes is an incredible array of plants that are coming from hundreds of different families. And that's one thing the ornamental industry never really recognizes is the biodiversity that we create. When you have a holly hedge, 
and a crepe myrtle, and a hydrangea, and a Japanese maple, and a couple of petunias. Actually, what you have there is a biodiverse landscape. You know, biodiversity to me is the thing that matters most because it's what's going to bring in the best amount of ecology. And when I talk about ecology, I think that I'm including everything but deer. <laughs> I don't like deer, and I don't like in-ground mammals. We all hate moles. I want to hopefully give y'all some tips to deal with those. So some of my favorite plants for adding biodiversity to the landscape, I love Baptisia. Uh, there's some incredible amount of breeding happening. I know Plant Delights is going to have a whole slew of super cool ones coming out. But, you know, in the last couple of years, these Baptisias have been bred to be better landscape plants. They're just, they're smaller, their colors are more intense, hold on to their foliage a little longer. Um, of course, Dr. Warner has completely changed the market on butterfly bushes, making them mostly sterile, a lot more dwarf. A lot of times these flowers will actually kind of fall off on their own, so you don't have to do a lot of cleaning up. You think about the bud bubbly of options of 20 years ago, boy, have we come a long way. And thank goodness Black Knight's not our only option. <laughs> I love Calicanthus, and I, you know, I'm a huge fan of anything Tom Rainey does. I really like Aphrodite as a, as a plant in the landscape that blooms, you know, during a time when the spring stuff has waned and a lot of the summer stuff hasn't totally picked up. It's a great plant for uh, attracting different insects. I don't want to live a life without it. Worthy of, that's the bottom line. You know, I think Mark says this about Osmanthus, but if you can't grow it worthy, I don't want to live there. I mean, my gosh, I need those little balls of sunshine in January. Of course, this is what it looks like in the summer, and I love to grow dill within it, because though it's not flowering, it sort of mimics the flower that it does produce in, in January, which of course is that. So wonderfully fragrant. Everything looks good against the Carolina blue sky, but as a former Michigander, it's worthy of blooming on the first day of January is something to brag about and make everyone in Michigan jealous of. <laughs> I'm a big fan of hibiscus. I can't help it. They're gaudy, and so am I. <laughs> <laughs> Mars Madness is a really cool one coming from Hans Hansen's breeding out of Walters. Hopefully you'll all be here for the symposium <coughs> later this month. He's really made some incredible changes to a lot of different genera, but you know, hibiscus in, in, in specific. Um, my plants at home this year at one time had like 40 flowers open mm -hmm. on any given day. And I don't have a tremendous, I need to knock on wood, Japanese beetle issue, so my foliage actually still looks good. Has anybody grown this hydrangea? Okay, good. This is, this is a, a, a cultivar that I really want to see get into the market more because it's just absolutely amazing. Uh, our Russians is, of course, a, an East Coast native hydrangea, and Haas's halo is, is just this beautiful one that has both sterile and fertile flowers on it and has this nice doming habit of about six by six, covered in flowers and not really sensitive to cold snaps. For attracting beneficial insects is um, probably my favorite pastime. I declared it last night on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the thing is, I love butterflies, of course, but it's not just about the butterflies. They're just the ones that are fun to take pictures of. Uh, you know, of course, before we imported the honeybees, we did have other insects that did the lion's share of the pollination of crops in, in the North American region, specifically wasps moths and houseflies. You know, we all hate houseflies. They're super gross. They don't get the credit they deserve for getting in there and moving pollen and pollen around, which they do quite a lot of. Now, this is a picture of some cane sorghum. I grow a lot of sorghum to press to make, to make uh, sugar. And cane sorghum is a magnet for aphids. Mm -hmm. And uh, being very interested in biocontrols from a nursery grower's perspective, I figured, well, I'm just going to let them go and see what happens. And what happens is they go to the bathroom and they create honeydew. That's such a sweet name. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, it's, it's fabulous. And that actually brings in this entire array of flying insects 
that are attracted to their honeydew. And then ultimately the lady beetle larva come in and they eat all the aphids and within two weeks everything is in balance again. It doesn't matter because you're not eating the foliage on, on cane sorghum anyway. Um, no pesticides need to be sprayed and your yard is suddenly a much safer place to walk through. You know, these guys don't get the credit they deserve. I don't love them at a, at a dinner party either. <laughs> Of course, Minarda is a plant that, you know, you know, if you want to, it's bee balm for a reason. It's definitely a good plant. These new varieties to me are probably going to be the solution, especially for people who like to have tidier landscapes and don't want plants to spread all over the place. These are interspecific hybrids, again, from Hans Hansen's breeding program that uh, at least so far in my yard, and I will keep you updated, have been very, very contained. They are very much just in a clump, growing happily, no powdery mildew. We've had a pretty bad summer for powdery mildew. So um, I'm pretty pleased with these, and they're much shorter. They're actually about knee high. Of course, Prunus mume, you've got to provide nectar for your <coughs> pollinators all, all seasons of the year. Too often we ignore January and February. Prunus mume are one of the best plants for honeybees at that time of year. If you don't have at least one Prunus Mume, do not tell me or I will judge you. Because <laughs> everyone needs to have at least one. And really, you should all have like 10. <laughs> First, I love that horticulture gets to be an industry that has causes. I, we've done a fabulous job with bees. If we can overcome the Zika problems, then we won't kill all the bees that we have harvest. Mm -hmm. Helen's doing a fabulous job. Go to the tour this weekend. Be better. You should have gotten information on it. And I love that monarchs are something that people are recognizing and understanding. And fundamentally, the thing that's challenged the monarchs is our monocultures of commercial agriculture, in which we have thousands of consecutive acres of corn. There are no row crops. There is no native biodiverse landscape, or not landscape, but prairie field for monarchs to be able to naturally go through. And so we're trying to compensate by fixing our home landscapes. And unfortunately, we're not doing the best job because we have been uh, perpetuating some bad milkweeds. This is not a bad milkweed. This is a good milkweed. What you want in an Asclepius is one that blooms and then it stops. You don't need an ever blooming Asclepius or they won't ever leave and they won't migrate. Mm -hmm. And that is not the solution because then they will die. So be conscientious in not only indulging in tropical milkweeds, though they are really beautiful and amazing, you do need to have a milkweed that's going to flower for a period of time and then stop blooming. Of course, I do come from cultivation, so where there's a species, I believe there is an improved cultivar. <laughs> Nothing wrong with the nectar coming from Hello Yellow, it just matches my house better. So, uh, you know, that's why we're in horticulture. <sighs> Oops. I'm obsessed with swallowtails. I'm not going to deny it. Uh, I have a million of them. Um, I can't control myself with them. But there's a lot of reasons why I have so many. And it's probably mostly because I grow so much food and of course I don't spray anything so they never get killed on purpose or by accident. And carrots are one of those plants that's a main source of nutrition for their larval stage. And so to me there's a thousand reasons that everyone should grow carrots. First of all, you can eat them and they're cool. And their flowers are really, really beautiful. Uh, they're extremely drought tolerant. They grow through the winter season. Um, you actually do two seasons of carrots in the Carolina climate. But of course, here they are getting munched on. Mm -hmm. Each flower head will leave you with like three million new carrots. So you don't even have to grow that many to be able to get a significant amount of seed. Dill is another one of those plants that I really grow it because I'm obsessed with dill pickles. Mm -hmm. I say but it's a great host plant for swallowtail lar larva. And fennel. I don't grow a lot of fennel because I don't grow a lot of perennials. When you come to visit my landscape, I'll explain that to a greater degree. Part of it is I had access to a lot of free trees and shrubs, which I planted on four inch centers. And I simply don't have room for running perennials when you overplant in that way. Uh, this is again at more farms. I think they did a 
beautiful job weaving fennel into their landscape and um, of course that's another host plant for the larval stage. Parsley, this is the living wall. Oh my gosh. I, I chuckle because you know in Michigan they grow all these things that we do through the cool season. They do it in the summer and this thing arrived on a pallet full of kale and parsley which would never really be active the season. My goodness, I'm so glad. I actually am tempted now to order vegetable plants the middle of summer from Michigan just to get a head start. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this, this is this week's explosion of, of swallowtails that uh, are at the moment going into chrysalis stage. So next week we should have a whole fresh batch of butterflies. Of course, Phlox paniculata is a great plant for attracting swallowtails as well. This is bright eyes. This is one, one of those perennials that I allow to come in, and then every year I think I rip it all out, mm -hmm. and then every year just as much comes back. It is seedy, and it's stomaliferous, and those are two things that I don't generally approve of, but I love swallowtails. Keeps it around. And zinnias. I don't know why there aren't zinnias in those hell strips instead of those stupid petunias. The zinnias are a whole lot more capable of growing in those extreme conditions from seed without irrigation, some of those practical plants that you could grow through the summer. And of course, here in Carolina, once you have them, you're gonna have them because they're gonna seed and that seed will germinate the next year. And if you don't like it, you can just rip it out. It's a pretty easy solution. Yeah, I do believe that all plants have a practical purpose, but some plants have more practicality than others. You know, if I have my choice between dianthus and strawberries, guess what? <laughs> I'm going for strawberries. <laughs> I can't eat dianthus. That dianthus only blooms for like two weeks of the year, you know, and then it's just this weird silver mound. Uh, I like strawberries better, and most of America does too. You know, it's empowering to come home and know that I can pick, I don't know, 10 gallons of strawberries from my foundation <laughs> landscape. I know there's nothing been sprayed on them. I know they're safe to eat without, without having to wash them. It's awesome. I love being able to serve strawberries that were picked 15 minutes prior to eating. I love tea. How many of you grow tea? I know I forced fed tea on a, ha a handful of people <laughs> while I was working at Camellia Forest. You know, if you can grow azaleas, you can grow a tea plant. And if nothing else, you'll have a greater appreciation for the prices that Lipton has created. <laughs> because it's really labor intensive to make your own tea. It's not the fact that you do it all the time, it's the option that you can. Sometimes you don't have to be a homesteader to enjoy the, you know, the benefits of a plant like a tea. It's a wonderful hedge. Um, I, I'd like to see this in, in more foundation landscapes, frankly, because I think it has better longevity than azaleas. And of course, vaccinium's blueberries are really the gateway to foodscaping. Noel Weston has maybe the best collection in North Carolina. If you've never been to Weston Farms, well, you should get out there because they have a lot of amazing plants, but if you go during blueberry season, you are in for a treat because they have so many cultivars and there's varieties that bloom <coughs> early, midsummer, late. Uh, really, you can have four or five months of consecutive fruit set if you get the right cultivars. Of course, you can't beat the fall color. Mm -hmm. I would put this against any euonymus, almost any euonymus. There's that one tree, where's Tim, that you have in the parking lot. That might be better than blueberry. <laughs> I'll give you that. And of course, NC State came out with these uh, cultivars of the smaller species, Doroei. So if you're looking for blueberries for containers or smaller landscapes, these are decent options. Their fruit is very small. And in my garden, the yellow finches eat them all. Uh, but they save the big juicy blueberries for me. So it's totally okay. Of course, fruit trees, I think, are something that can be very challenging if you try to go traditional. Will has probably the coolest persimmon. If you haven't been to Will Hooker's garden in Raleigh, you need to, because it's awesome. Uh, persimmons and pawpaws, to me, are two trees that you should definitely consider putting in. So you're never really gonna find those fruits at the grocery store because they don't travel well. They are very transportable. Uh, both native trees, there's actually the, my favorite uh, 
per, or my favorite uh, persimmons are actually interspecific hybrids, but uh, that's because I had an experience in Indiana where my friends tricked me into eating a non-ripe persimmon. <laughs> totally changed my life. I appreciate saliva. <laughs> Of course, persimmons, even Cubby approves of persimmons. Uh, when you come out on, on Tuesday, get prepared to give this cat attention because he is a seeker of it and takes picture because he enjoys that. He is Cubby Brewster on Instagram if you're keen to post on social media. Hazelnuts. Now, I know I kind of sound crazy, but hazelnuts, I think, are going to have a huge impact in the next decade. I was just at Rutgers two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and I went through their hazelnut breeding program, which is absolutely astounding. And they're doing interspecifics between the American and the European. They have found disease resistant, uh, well, they targeted g the genes of disease resistance, have made the selections, and not only have they been breeding for disease, but they've been breeding for this amazing color and this quilted texture. So uh, look out for hazelnuts. Will, you were the one that really got me on the hazelnut bandwagon. It's a crop that's a big thing out west, specifically in Oregon, but there's going to be an influx of hazelnut being grown on the east coast now that these varieties are becoming available. It has very low inputs, meaning very few disease, very few insects, and very low fertility needs. So a cost per acre is less than any other agronomic crop that we currently grow. And even if you're not into eating the nuts, you can press them for the oil, which is like 5,000 times nicer than olive oil. I didn't know that until I got to indulge in some of it when I was up at Rutgers and I thought, holy crap, <laughs> this is going to be what Gwyneth Paltrow is talking about. <laughs> First, there's the nuts. You roast them, they smell amazing. So, you know, pests are always the biggest problem for why people say I can't grow vegetables, and I totally get it. And, um, you know, there are going to be some pests that I, I don't have good advice for. Uh, mostly with deer, if you're able to break up the way they're walking, they're, they're very routine. If you're able to put a pot cyrus in the middle of their path, maybe they'll <laughs> go to your neighbors and leave you alone. Uh, you know, I used to work at Montrose, and Nancy used Pontyrus to keep elementary school kids off of her property, <laughs> so they would work for deer. <laughs> Very effective. <laughs> and one of the biggest problems that we have here in Carolina, of course, are voles. And um, I just, it was Abby, the, the sweet girl here in the middle, that was standing in the yard. And you know how sometimes kids talk, and you don't really pay attention, and you just think they're imagining things? She's like, why are the tulips shaking? Why are the tulips shaking? Miss Bree. Yeah, they were getting eaten right in front of our faces. You know, those bowls were there, and they were sucking that ball down, and we would pull the foliage out, and there was nothing there. It was like a cartoon. And I said, all right, that's the last time I'm investing in tulips. Well, that wasn't the truth because I don't love tulips. I can't help it. I told you I'm gaudy. I love a gaudy tulip. I then encase the beds with garlic. Guess what? Voles hate allium. You don't have to just grow garlic, you can grow onions, or you can grow ornamental uh, allium, like allium millennium. They hate allium. It makes the soil taste bad, so then they don't come through, and all of a sudden, you don't have voles in that space. It's pretty awesome. Then you can suddenly grow tulips, or pastas, if you dare. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you do, take into account how much garlic you consume. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't learn from me. I said, we eat garlic every day. Oh, plant 350 cloves. <laughs> and you know what that results in? 350 bulbs of garlic, which is like three times as much garlic as I actually need. So everybody gets stuck taking garlic home. We had a, a Ralston Arboretum dinner this summer, and that was like what your name's tag was on, was a bulb of garlic. <laughs> First, if you have neighborhood kids, they can ward off vampires, and they enjoy that. They're very good at braiding garlic, again, put their tiny hands to work. Uh, you know, again, I think that onions are a wonderful solution. Uh, if you're graced with a cool, dark space, you can grow onions and store them long term. 
Uh, last year, I grew a plethora of onions. We don't have such a space. So I spent like four days chopping them up to freeze. And that was painful. <laughs> so maybe space your crops out a little more rationally than I do. And you know, onions are really wonderful bringing in pollinators. I always let a few go to seed. Uh, that way I can have the seed for the next season. I don't really ever have to invest money in onion sets. It does take about six months longer to grow onions from seed. And Allium millennium, this is a plant that I don't see often enough in the Carolina landscape. Uh, in Michigan, I was in Michigan in, in July, it was everywhere. I mean, just absolutely astounding. It was so beautiful. And they do this specifically in Holland, Michigan, because they grow the most tulips of anywhere else in the United States. And they have bowl issues. And so they, they basically have Allium Millennium around every single bed that's filled with tulips for the spring show. So. Because I think lavender is a plant that doesn't always get the acknowledgement that it deserves for being a pest keeper aware. <laughs> and, um, you know, specifically deer don't really like lavender. It's a little bit prettier than Ponsiris. So if you want to plant a border of this. Now, lavenders are traditionally very difficult to grow in the Carolinas. And I found only two varieties have done well for me. So Phenomenal, which is... Uh, came out of my good friend, uh, Peace Tree Farms, Lloyd, Lloyd and Candy Traven. And it's a big old plant. You know, give this thing some space. It's not one of your tiny little head coats. This is gonna every bit be four by four. Give it the space it deserves. Uh, the other one is um, Platinum Blonde. And I did not anticipate this one to be such a success. Now, I do have it cited under a live oak. So maybe that hog of a tree is absorbing every bit of water and making it so the lavender survives. But nevertheless, it's had a really nice mounded habit. It's going into its fourth growing season. I haven't had any dieback on it. And um, I, I have to say I'm, I'm shocked and surprised. So when you come out on Tuesday, uh, I will point it out to you. But it's like one of the first plants you'll notice when you walk into the driveway. And of course, when people complain about deer problems, I often will say, well, you're not growing enough peppers. <laughs> because, let's face it, they don't eat peppers. They don't like the fruit, they don't like the foliage. You want to grow soybeans and not have bunny rabbits eat them? Grow your soybeans in and amongst peppers. Um, the deer stay away from these things. I highly recommend growing them. Even if you don't want to eat all the fruit, this kind of harvest maybe is irrational. I won't deny it. <laughs> I happen to like candied peppers, so all these ones that look like they're hot get a giant douse of sorghum syrup, and suddenly they are palatable. So I hope that you all will understand that throwing some food crops into your landscape adds value, makes it perfect, makes it achievable, makes it awesome, right? It gives you the ace. I think that more landscapes have value when people are interacting in them. When we're not passively seeing a space and not appreciating it. And food is that thing that really helps connect those dots. I've got roses don't make me feel engaged. They never did, you know? Mm -hmm. But seeing a fat swallowtail on a, on a fennel plant gives me goosebumps because it's something greater than myself. And I don't think that I'm alone. It's exciting to see when people interact in a space and they feel empowered because they see things they recognize. You know, too often we have gardens full of plants that everyone's intimidated to learn the name of. Then they see a broccoli plant and they're like, I know what it is. I'm not stupid. I got this. And so part of foodscaping really is just about getting back to the basic and making it so that the average person and feel a connection to a space that they're otherwise intimidated by. So, oops. I hope you'll all dream big. I dream big, sometimes too big. Imagine if every landscape grew a little bit of food. You know, imagine if you grew 10% of what you eat. 10% really isn't that much. Think about the native habitats that could be restored because of the change in our commercial agriculture dynamic. You know, think about the reduction of food miles, the decreasing of monocropping, 
really the changes in some of the unsafe or unknown hard chemistry cultures mm -hmm. that exist because of the way we currently grow food. You know, I think we can all deserve to feel a little bit more empowered when we come home at the end of the day. Everybody, we live in a busy, stressful, disruptive time. I get to walk around and snap pictures of butterflies. It makes my life feel better. I want that experience to be able to be accessed by more people. You know, and that is accessible through horticulture. So, raise your right hand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm peer pressuring you now to take the food skating pledge and to grow a little bit of food and encourage the people around you to grow a little food themselves and support your local farmers and really think about how your food is grown and where it is grown and how we can collectively raise the value that horticulture represents, not only in our American culture, but globally. So cheers to you all for listening to me, Rand. Thank you so much for having me. And if you have questions, you can Thank you so much, Bree. Does anyone have any questions for her? When does your book come out and does your book include all this information? <laughs> oh, that book! <laughs> the book will be available uh, March 15th. The manuscript is due in 14 days. <sighs> I was so excited that I got to leave my office today. I can't even describe it. So yes, it does include all of this. It also includes um, a lot of plant lists, a whole lot of plant lists. I've uh, worked with now, I guess, 26 regional professionals to be able to provide advice that can be applied to all of the specific areas across the US and Canada. And then a lot of recipes, because what the heck do you do with all this produce, right? Gotta eat it somehow, and I've tried to Make it a full yard to table experience. You grow it, you, you create this ecosystem, and this is how you nourish your family and your friends and your community. So, March. Uh, your super sod soil. Yes. Is, is, would that be appropriate for container plants, or is that too dense? You know, I kind of feel like it would be. So the thing that's interesting with the super sod, and Helen knows this as well too. It's derived of green good, so lawn clippings and, and, and broken down um, leaves. It's not an animal-based fertilizer or not an animal-based uh, product, so it doesn't decompose and get as dense. And is that the right yeah, description? It's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an organic compost more than it is a soil. Right, yeah. it's like hummus rich, it's really well drained and light. Not to say that the bag is light, it's it's not. You, you need you need a you need a machine to move it. But I haven't used it in pots per se. I have used it in those felt containers, and um, it's done perfectly fine in, in those. Yeah. I use it to top dress around my fruit trees. That was a good use. Very very And I used it to grow my 850 square foot grain bed, and it totally does a trick. Mm -hmm. And one yard was enough, mm -hmm. shockingly. Yeah. Um, it's it's high quality. With your grain bed, did you ever end up processing the wheat and the rice, and how was that? Okay, so that's the, that is an exciting thing. The first year I did it, I did a conventional variety, a modern variety. And um, we didn't even try hand threshing it. My husband built this thing. <laughs> with a drill in a, in a bucket okay. and uh, beat the crap out of it. It was totally <laughs> useless as far as decoration once it was threshed. Yeah. Um, and then you, you tip it over a box fan and you know right, the, yeah. it all that goes away and, and what you're left with is seed. And we got 25 pounds of ground flour from 850 square feet. It's a bed that dissects the middle of my front yard and was originally planted with pink muley all of which died because we were too wet. Mm -hmm. So, Rosalind Creasy, the lady that really pioneered edible landscaping, I was relating the story to her and she said, grow something useful. Mm -hmm. And I will never forget 
her words because it completely changed my perspective on what useful was. And um, with rice, I don't grow my rice in that bed because that bed gets converted into cane sorghum. Mm -hmm. um, I do tend to grow my rice in areas closer to the house where I can keep a closer eye on it and keep it watered if we do get dry. And I grow it in a lot of spaces near downspouts. Mm -hmm. So I allow that excess water to flush right to it. Mm -hmm. And um, this year I have 75 rice plants in my home landscape. And I'm pretty confident I'll get at least 25 pounds of rice seed from it. They're currently producing huge amounts of seed. They start in, G in July and rice will continuously set seed until we have a hard frost. So it's a long process. Whereas with the wheat, it happens all at once. It does happen at a relatively inconvenient time. Uh, if I wasn't being an idealist, I would mow it and not look back because hand harvesting is really hard. <laughs> You'll find me out there at like midnight with a headlamp because it's always really hot at the time of year when we need to be harvested. <laughs> but the, the, the grains to me, I really think 10 years from now, it's going to be something that people are like, yeah, of course, of course I grow wheat. I'm a hipster, you know. <laughs> Can I add that we did a story on Bree's wheat that's coming out in the country garden issue in January. Yes. It really, the photography in it is to die for. <laughs> and, also, and also, don't miss the article in the uh, Triangle Gardener. Oh, mm -hmm. is it out now? I need yes, to pick it's, that up. It's yes. in the issue that's, that's out in the lobby. Okay, good. And there's a podcast about it, too. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever done hostas as an edible? You know, I've heard people talk about hostas as an edible. I haven't. Um, it certainly is edible because every other, every other mammal eats it, right? I mean, why <laughs> I don't actually have any hostas in my garden. Um, part of that is that I just never reinvested in, in plants like that, and I didn't have access to free ones. I'll be perfectly honest. <laughs> it's funny because it is edible and it, it's cooked like a green, like a spinach, but it's one of those ornamental plants, but that's not why you're growing it. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of great plants like that that we don't even think about. We don't think about at all. Well, I'll tell you, I used to go to the Hossa Convention when I worked at Plant Delights. And if I had said, oh, you just bought a $500 edible, <laughs> I would have loved to have seen the reaction. <laughs> I saw this. Oh, good God. Wait till you come out. I thought, yeah, for some, I don't know what I was thinking, for some reason, either the oh God, but flea beetles, eat those leaves up and it's skinny in it, and I have got some flea beetles at my house. I don't know how to deal with those. Get chickens. <laughs> and then Cubby will eat the chickens. <laughs> um, Amaranth is definitely a back of the border kind of plant. I don't know what possessed me to sprinkle it where I did. <laughs> but I mean, I had it all along my foundation edge. And two weeks ago, I cut most of it down. I do have it in a couple of other areas, but Amaranth is a beast. It's more than 10 foot tall. I mean, some of the stalks are, you know, like six inches in diameter. And um, I'm really intimidated by it. I'm not gonna deny it. I don't really know how to even begin to process it. And I do not want those billion seeds to land on my soil. <laughs> so I'm a little bit freaked out about amaranth. But I do have it. <laughs> and I may have it, I may never not have it, right? <laughs> Have you worked with any of the builders in town, the big ones like Pulte, to teach them about foodscaping and how they can help in our environment? I sure as heck am trying. Yeah. Uh, you know, I used to work with Pulte quite a lot when I was in wholesale production. And I've uh, gotten in touch with all the people I know. If you guys know people to get me in touch with, I am desperate to get this message into the developers' heads so that they could see a return on investment for why they need to do a better job preparing green space. Uh, you know, I think builders create the surface of Mars and then homeowners move here from zone five where growing plants is super easy. And then they're like, oh, North Carolina is terrible. I can't grow anything. 
but this compact a holly hedge that the builder provided me. That's it. That's all I can do. And I would love to get more builders on target with this. I've worked with some custom builders. Of course, they are much easier to deal with because they have homeowners that are already investing a larger portion of their budget to the green space. And that's the main problem with track developers right now is that green space takes up 0.001% of the building budget. And that's why horticulture needs to be raised universally in its value because we're just as important as a roof, you know. We live in downtown Raleigh uh, in an old neighborhood and I try to grow lantana and herbs to flower for the bees and the butterflies and I feel really concerned that in the past several years many neighbors are getting that mosquito gel uh -huh. and, and they say it's harmless to any kind of mosquito but I feel like there's such a reduction in the butterflies and the bees and we're not really sure what I don't either. This is a huge problem. And I know Gina was addressing this with the master gardeners uh, because there is no such thing as an insecticide that only impacts mosquitoes. Wake up, y'all. Uh, and we have a whole lot more in common with insects than we want to acknowledge. Uh, I totally understand what you're saying, and I definitely don't know how to fix it until we all get everybody to understand that our species can't exist on this planet without insects, period. And we fall in love with sexy ones like honeybees and butterflies, but we have to appreciate all the bugs. And I'm not saying that I love mosquitoes and I don't want to see our species die off from Zika, but the solution is absolutely not to put toxic chemicals out, whether they are organically derived chemicals or not, they are still going to impact insects mm -hmm. in a wide, wide array of, of different ways. So I think that's a huge problem. It's going to make entomology more important. Mm -hmm. We think horticulture doesn't count. These poor entomologists mm -hmm. don't get any credit. <laughs> they are, yeah. So they will now. They're in demand. And if, if Congress ever gets its act together, you know, <laughs> maybe science will get to be utilized. <laughs> For a median in a highway, um, not an overly used freeway, but what type of lands of uh, edibles would you suggest for these butterflies in that type of an environment? I would Less probably, money. I would probably go the grain route. I would do like a mix of, of winter grains, whether it's barley or oats or wheat with things like larkspur and um, nigella poppies. And then when those things die out early summer, I'd replace them with, you know, zinnias and and maybe something like sorghum, not not cane sorghum, but grain sorghum, because they have very low water needs. So in unirrigated spaces that have a lot of heat surrounding them, heat islands, I think zinnias and sorghum tend to be some of the better options. Soybeans. I didn't mention soybeans, but I really like growing legumes, not because I love eating soy, but because I like plants that provide nitrogen so that I don't have to add excessive amounts of fertility. And soybeans have, for me, have done really well in some of the driest spots of my garden. See them out in fields in the area that are unirrigated and they grow well. Um, generally with food crops, when, when I think of like highway plantings, I would try to figure out what the farmers are doing and then apply that with a little bit of whimsy. <laughs> a little bit of spri you know, sprinkling the magic dust of seed makes a big difference. And of course, anything like that, don't ever transplant, direct sow. The more you can direct sow in the landscape, the less maintenance overall you're going to have and the more sustainable they'll be and that they won't have this period where they need to have water provided to them because the potting soil dries out more quickly than the native soil. So anytime you can cultivate a space that has soil that is loose enough for you to germinate seeds in, always just sow it direct. Save yourself a whole lot of time and effort. That's bad for the nursery industry, but. We have no really great world
You're the third person that's asked me that today, and I don't know, I have a feeling it's probably going to be sometime late October. Um, we did an episode with, with Craig Lujulia, who is the tomato man. He is so awesome. And um, Joe, the host of the show, and then myself, all growing in different ways. Craig is featured for uh, hay bales. I'm featured for alternative growing systems, meaning aquaponics, hydroponics, aeroponics, and then Joe is growing in conventional raised beds. And we kind of compare our yields and see how ugly our plants get, who's <laughs> getting ugly fastest, and <laughs> growing tomatoes is not for the light of heart. That's what I will say. <laughs> but it should be a really fun episode. It ends at the annual tomato tasting where you can see our faces melting. <laughs> because it was really unbearably hot this year. <laughs> the people who were there could attest to that. <laughs> All right, now how many of you are coming on Tuesday that are in this room? Okay, awesome. I'll have, I'll have some homegrown snacks and refreshments out, so come a little hungry. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to having you all. This timing, Chris, you could not have set this up better. We try our talk best. And a tour. So I encourage you all to spread the good word and come and visit Fuquay and get to the Be Better Tour this weekend. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you so much, Marie.